This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. Your sexual self-esteem is fundamental and you need to nourish it. Everyone's sexuality will be different to the next person. One person's yummy things that they love to do will be another person's yucky things that they really don't want to do. Having a condition called vaginismus, which is, it sounds like Christmas of the vagina, but it's opposite. It's like Halloween. Every single woman in the world has been told that there's something that they need to change about their body. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? Welcome to the Season 2 Expert Series, where you'll meet 24 of the world's leaders in health, discussing their passions and what it takes to make a shift. We tend to be our, our harshest critics. We are more than the muscle and bones in our body. Whoa, that's so opposite of what I was taught growing up. I would like a call to arm for women to know that their intuition isn't lying to them. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. Hi, I'm Catherine Maslin, naturopath, author, and host of The Shift. In the expert series, we share the insight stories and expertise of each of our amazing experts. We're talking doctors, authors, naturopaths, researchers, and thought leaders. You may have heard them on season two of The Shift, where we took snippets of these interviews to put them together in the series for you. If you haven't listened to season two yet, I'd highly recommend checking out episode one, which will give you an overview of what constitutes women's hormonal health and a sneak peek into the series. We'll provide a link in the show notes. Chantelle Otten is a psychosexologist and the founder of her practice of the same name in Melbourne. She heads up a team of sexologists and sexual health experts that help patients regain their self-esteem and work through issues related to sexuality of all kinds. Chantelle has a Bachelor of Psychological Science and a Master's Degree in Psychosexual Health. Her contributions to sexology and sexual medicine have been recognised with award nominations and she is a regular presenter at conferences on sexual health worldwide. Chantelle has two published articles in the Journal of Sexual Medicine and her work has been featured in Cosmopolitan Magazine, The New York Post, Body and Soul Magazines and several other publications. She is known as a leader in the area of sexual health, self-esteem, intimacy, and communication. This conversation is real, raw, super inspiring, and a little bit juicy. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Chantelle Odden, thank you so much for joining me on The Shift. I can't wait to get into some really deep and juicy conversations with you. But before we do, can you tell our audience... Who are you? What is your story that's led you to be working in the field that you are today? So I am a sexologist. Specifically now, I am a psychosexologist. So when you're a sexologist, you are someone who is researching the reason why people are their sexual selves. I work in the psychological field of sexology. So I work with the biggest sexual organ, which is the brain. And I provide psychological therapy that is, I guess, holistic because I have a really great team of amazing practitioners that specialize in different areas, including pelvic health, you know, general health, gynecology, obstetrics, et cetera. And we focus on working out why we are having difficulties or concerns or questions with a sex life and how we can make it better. It sounds very complex and that's because it is. It's like being a detective into someone's sexual life and that can span, you know, over looking into every aspect of their life, essentially. I became a psychosexologist because I did psych and I realized that I really didn't want to become a generalized psychologist. I think, you know, I was really ready for like a challenge. And I'm also very goal orientated as well. And that's something that with sexology you can be, you know, you have to aim towards having a pleasurable and fun sexual life that is pain-free and safe. Uh, And I just found that, you know, I was looking at different areas of psychology and I wasn't finding my place. And my mom called me one day 
and I have a Dutch background and we're very open in my family about sex. And she said, you know what, you need to watch Esther Perel's TED Talk on infidelity. Now, Esther Perel is a psychotherapist who focuses on relationships, you know, and has really had an amazing amount of work that she's put into infidelity and desire. Uh, And I realized, you know, I was 22 back then, no one was talking about sex. Like sex specifically in Australia was not talked about. It was not part of the healthcare system. There were no psychosexologists working in hospitals. In fact, you know, when I went around Melbourne and met a lot of the sexologists here, I really saw that there was a niche in terms of making it more of a holistic space and a safe space, somewhere that I would want to go and where my family would want to go. And, you know, I really wanted to get in, into a hospital as well. So I did my science medicine degree, specializing in sexual medicine. And then I moved to Amsterdam because I have a Dutch passport and I did my sexology degree there. And I interned for free for two years and worked full time in that internship. And then I published a whole heap of studies around women's sexual health that won awards in female sexual medicine. And I thought it's probably time I come back to Australia and, and really implement it here. So I moved back when I was 26 and started my practice. And now I have um, 20 people that work for me in this amazing clinic, and they're all superstars. And uh, I work across a lot of media and within different organizations. And it's just so much fun. You know, I'm really lucky. (laughs) So I can imagine that there's a lot of people listening to this that would never even fathom the fact that they could go and see somebody like a therapist to work on Mm. sex stuff, right? Yeah. And for you, obviously this is your passion, right? And I guess there's a, a background behind that. What do you see that the dysfunction is with people around sexuality? Like what is the bigger problem that you're trying to solve? I think it's just that we have a real lack of education around sexuality in Australia. It's just not normalized. In fact, it's like being mocked quite a bit. You know, there is also like a, there's only a one hour lecture on sexual medicine and medical degrees in Australia. That to me shows that it's just not of importance. And I think when you are looking at sexuality and the reason why people don't talk about it, you have to look at it from a psychological point of view you know, how are people feeling within themselves to talk about it? A lot of people have sexual problems, you know, that leads to discomfort, that leads to deflection, that leads to not being able to have that conversation. There's also a cultural aspect. We are a multicultural society. We have different areas of education around sexuality, different belief systems from a religious point of view and a spiritual point of view. And that has led to definitely a lot of drawback from being able to normalize this topic. And I just think that, to be honest, like in a relationship, sex and like talking to your partner about sex is probably one of the hardest things that most people will have to do, let alone discussing it in a vulnerable way with doctors, with friends, you know, with colleagues. And I know that for a lot of people who have had sexual problems, they've gone to get help from their GP who hasn't had the skills to be able to discuss that topic with them and feels like it's opening up a can of worms in the session. So it's just been put off or it's been deflected or they've been told to relax or have a glass of wine or have a bath before sex and everything will be fine. But the reality is sex is very complex and usually it will involve not just yourself but maybe someone else as well. And when you're working with two people, then it's a couple's problem. So it's it's a very difficult place for people to be and it's a very lonely place for people to be if they have a sexual problem. And I really hope and I, I think I've felt that there has been a shift over at least like the past 18 months that people are starting to be able to talk about it and have you know safe places to go where they're going to get the right type of treatment and support. So it's almost like women and men, I guess, but you know we're talking about women a lot in these series is that they kind of like feel like they're boxed in, right? So they have these thoughts or feelings or emotions or or dysfunction or issues that they have around their sexuality and their ability to communicate, but it's so taboo that they feel shameful even talking about it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Shame is like a huge component, you know. I don't want to be the only person to have to talk about this because in general we don't talk about sex. When you do have a sexual concern, you do feel like you are the only one in the world that's talking about it. 
which I guess is why I have my Instagram and I put out so much like free information on there because it is helping, you know, for every one person that sees me in my clinic, there's hundreds of thousands more people that have the same concern and just being able to provide information and show people that it's normal to have these questions and thoughts and feelings means that the conversation changes and they can reach out for help without shame because they know that it's been talked about before in my clinic. So what do you do when you have a couple and one of the partners is ready and wants to be vulnerable and talk about stuff, but the other has such deep seated belief systems that it's, you know, you don't talk about this stuff and they can't actually open up that can of worms. I think at that point, you have to make a decision as a couple, where do you want to go? I think that if you want to be able to bond over this, to be able to indulge in this part of your intimate life, then you have to make a decision as a team that you will both work on it and you will both have the motivation to put in the kind of steps forward to be able to get to the place that is able to talk a little bit more comfortably about sex. And often in those circumstances, I will have one of the individuals in the couple working with one of my other sexologists and one of them working with me. And we work on these issues separately until they are both ready to come together and discuss it as a team turned towards each other. Let's talk about sexuality, right? So we have sex, but then sexuality. What does sexuality mean to you? Sexuality is all encompassing. I mean, it comes down to so many things. I really believe that sexuality is a fundamental part of your overall quality of life. I do believe that it is important for everyone to have a healthy sense of sexuality, to be able to, I guess, get support for what they need and also to not feel ashamed of their sexuality. And look, everyone's sexuality will be different to the next person. One person's yummy things that they love to do will be another person's yucky things that they really don't want to do. What I like to say is it's all under an umbrella and it's all part of a sexual menu. You just get to pick what's on that menu and what suits you and your relationship. So let's say someone's been together for like 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. How do they maintain, you know, this... I guess, a exciting sex life or a fulfilling sex life, you know, after doing the same thing over and over for so many years? Well, they have to make a decision to not do the same thing over and over for 20 years. You're always going to have to develop, not just as a couple as well, like when you're in a relationship for a decent period of time, whether it be two years, 10 years, 20 years, you're not going to be the same person that you were when you started dating the other, you know, you're going to have to develop, you're going to have to grow. And it's the same in your sex life. When we get together with someone, we kind of look at them and go, Hey, Catherine, these are all the things I don't want to do. So here is this pile of things that I am comfortable doing. And you can go, Chantel, that's cool. I don't want to do these things. So here are my leftovers as well. And we have our leftovers and we can keep eating leftovers if we want. It's nice. It's yummy. There are different things that we like on there. But at the end of the day, it's like eating spaghetti bolognese for dinner, like four times a week or three times or two times a week. It starts to become a bit routine and mundane and you start to not really look forward to having spaghetti all the time. You want to try different cuisines, different spices, different flavors. And that is the same with sex. We should always stay curious. We should always expand. We need to try different positions, different toys, different lubes, you know, different ways of communicating. And that will keep the sex life going. If you can both maintain a sense of curiosity and uh, be able to plan different ways to have sex, then it's going to be okay. Can we talk about the balance between the actual emotional relationship, or I guess the connection that we have with your partner on a non-sexual level and how that impacts stuff that's going on in the bedroom, but also the sex part of it and how that impacts on the relationship and vice versa? So if you're going well in a relationship, if things are fun, if you're comfortable, if it's light, I can imagine that you're going to be bringing in good energy into the bedroom as well. If things are going a little bit rough, if you're having arguments, if there's bickering and you're not sure how to repair from those kind of arguments, because it's normal to have arguments, it's more about how you repair from them. If you're bringing in energy that is holding back, that is not allowing you to be open with your partner, 
then it's very hard to open your body to your partner and be vulnerable within uh, an erotic space with them. And it's the same, I guess, in the bedroom. There's a lot of people that are held together by their sexual lives. They find them to be very positive sex lives. They can connect over sex. And if the sex is good, actually that helps the rest of the relationship. If the sex is suffering, it can be sometimes very difficult and can overlap into the relationship quite a bit because a lot of couples in that space start to feel like they are not being desired or that they are missing out. And unfortunately, you know, for a lot of people who are in relationships that are monogamous, they can't get sex from anyone else. They need to get it from their partner. So it can leave people in a very lonely place and it can lead to them turning away from their partner instead of turning towards. Want to look deeper into your own health? Our virtual naturopathic team help people all over the world to shift their health and their lives. We offer a 90-minute online discovery and diagnostic session where you can find out where you're at, why things are happening, and what you need to do about it. Everyone is an individual, and sometimes it can help to have someone break down your journey and see where you need to head next. To find out more, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Clinic. So we talked about sexuality as this all-encompassing thing and as it being a really important part of health. So as sexuality is an important part of our health, what is the consequence of somebody who has their sexuality shut down? So they might be in a relationship or not, but they're not having sex. There's no self-pleasuring. There's no connection with that part of themselves. What's the consequence of that? They feel like their body is a prison. They don't feel like it's a chateau that they're allowed to open the doors and let people in to explore. They don't feel like they can wander around in that chateau and explore different rooms, different energies, different feelings. They feel like they are literally stuck in a prison, that they cannot open the doors. That's lonely. That's isolating. That can be dark. That leads to lack of desire. That leads to, you know, also mental health concerns as well, anxiety, maybe depression. And I think that it's important for people to recognize that you don't have to be in that space. There are people that are out there to help you and your relationship in getting to a place where you feel good. And look, in some relationships, that might never happen. The partner might never be on board. And that's when you have to really consider, am I able to continue being in this relationship at the capacity it's at? Or do I need to pivot? Maybe I need to grow further beyond this relationship or maybe my partner will be able to follow me or maybe this isn't the right relationship for me or maybe I'm allowed to have sex with other people it really depends on the way that you navigate that as a couple because depriving yourself or depriving your partner from sex is just a very difficult gridlock to be in and it can take a while to undo that so I'm very much more about being preventative and trying your best at the start of relationships to really communicate as best you can and to keep moving forward to make sure that you have healthy communication around intimacy eroticism I have goosebumps from what you said with that because it was just such a good analogy, you know, thinking about creating our own prison really, you know, internally and being able to deal with that and and the consequence that that has for people is just huge. And these questions are also really big life questions, aren't they? You know, like, should I leave my partner? Do we need to go and do therapy? Like it's big decisions that you've got to really have courage to be able to face. Totally. I really believe that therapy should be an option that is for preventative measures. I believe that everyone should do therapy in their relationship, starting at the beginning of the relationship, because it just helps so much in being able to improve you as a team moving forward. And it's something that I've always valued very highly because I know that so much can be avoided if you just have a safe space to be able to discuss these issues. I love that. Um, And I completely agree. And I'm hoping that from people listening to this podcast, they can be like, oh, there's actually options that can help me. You know, you don't have to do it all on your own. I want to come back to the concept of sexuality. So we talked about with relationships, with that other person, how do we harness our own sexuality outside of your partner or that other person that you may be having sex with or playing with? How do we work on that? So your sexual self-esteem is fundamental and you need to nourish it. It's like self-care. I think that 
we're at this kind of consumerism place in terms of self-care where people consider it to be going and getting a facial and getting a massage and taking time out to get a fake tan and get their nails done. And I think that, yeah, all of that's kind of fun. But do you leave feeling like super wholesome and beautiful all the time from that? I think that actually it should be fundamental in terms of like sexuality should be incorporated into this self-care. You need to wear clothes that make you feel like fun and erotic. And I'm really big in terms of how fashion makes you feel. I think that even just having a hot shower and noticing the way that the water drops on your skin or rubbing lotions and potions on you, you know, after you've kind of cleansed and washed off the day or spending just some time to dedicate to yourself, look in the mirror, look at your genitals in the mirror, you know, all of it is about tapping into that sense of eroticism, the way that you are able to anticipate a a sexual interaction or an erotic interaction with yourself or with someone else. You are your best sexual partner. You have to nourish yourself. So tell me a little bit about what you've observed with your research and your work in the way that we're conditioned as women to hate our bodies. Oh my God. You know what? It's such a it just comes down to the patriarchy really. You know, the fact that we as women have been told Every single woman in the world has been told that there's something that they need to change about their body. You know, there's something that's not right. The beauty standards are so unachievable for everyone that we are expected to look a certain way and feel a certain way and be a certain size. And I know that we're embracing a lot more variety and diversity in that in 2021, but still it's undoing like decades worth of marketing that is aimed at changing us and fixing us. It's decades worth of us not feeling like we're on par with others or that we deserve to have everything that we want or we deserve to feel sexy. It's really like a Madonna horror complex, like be sexy, but not too sexy, be feminine, but be aggressive. You know, if you're standing up for your rights and you're an aggressive female, like it's all encompassing and it just leaves you know, women in a really precarious place where they're not sure what they should be or who they should be because they want to be all encompassing, but they're being told that they're not allowed to be. I think the trajectory that we're on is is a really good place. And, you know, the week that we're recording this is a very difficult week in Australia because we've had a lot of women's rights rallies going on because of our political climate and because of sexual assault cases in parliament and across the world. You know, I think that it's a really hard and emotional place to be right now as a woman. I think that we need to band together and we need to accept diversity, you know, when it comes to race, when it comes to ability, when it comes to the way that we express ourselves. And I think that If we continue to move along this path of embracing diversity and embracing the fact that we should all be ourselves and abolishing body shaming and fat phobia and racism and ableism, then I think that we will be in a much better place, hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later. I want to talk a little bit about sexual assault and uh, the impact that that has for women because, I mean, as we were just talking about, it's so sadly incredibly common. What is the impact of that for women? Because I'm sure that shows up a lot in your practice. Yeah. Look, a huge amount of my patients are sexual assault victims. And I think every single woman that I know and have seen has experiencing elements of assault in their lives and has been scared. I really believe that it can impact the way that we express ourselves on a huge level because When your body has been violated, when you and your personal space and your safety has been violated, it leaves you in a place of fear. And that can lead to conditions like lack of desire or being unable to orgasm or having a condition called vaginismus, which is, it sounds like Christmas of the vagina, but it's opposite. It's like Halloween. It's like 
when your pelvic floor muscles that surround your vagina tense up and tighten to protect your body from anything going inside of it. And that can be a tampon, that can be a finger, that can be a cervical screening device, or it can be a penis or a dildo. And that is painful for a lot of women. And when you start having penetrative sex that is painful, you don't want to have sex because if you feel like you're getting razor blade like cuts inside your vagina every single time, it's very hard to desire something that's going to cause you so much pain. So I know that this impacts a huge amount on the way that we are able to express ourselves as women and able to be embodied when we are erotic. So vaginismus is obviously like a major thing. I want to talk a little bit about just painful intercourse in general. What do you observe for women with that and what kind of approaches do you look at taking for them? One in five women will experience painful sex in their life. That can be deep pain, deep up inside the pelvis. That can be a bit more superficial pain. So on the entrance of the vagina, which is more vaginismus, there is also pain on the vulva. The vulva is the opening, the skin that's touching your underwear is the vulva. So everyone's been talking about the vagina for years, but the vagina is only the hole that a finger or a tampon or a penis goes in. The vulva is actually all the skin that touches your underwear. And there can be pain on that skin as well, pain on the clitoris, pain on the opening. These are all things that can be addressed very easily through a sexological session and through working with a multidisciplinary team. It's definitely something that I specialize in and I love it because for a lot of people, they've waited years to have a diagnosis and to be able to, you know, within a couple of months, bring them to a place where they don't have pain is a really exciting thing to be able to do and such a pleasure. What I've observed, and I'm sure you have as well, is that some women will have painful intercourse. They get a new partner and uh, the pain goes away. And it's not related to penis size or frequency of sex or anything like that. Have you observed that in your practice as well? Yeah, of course. So painful sex is not just physiological. It's not just related to the body. A huge amount of it is related to the brain and how we feel about sex and how we feel about our sexual partner. So that comes back to what we have talked about previously, where a relationship can really impact the way that we feel erotically. And the way that we engage in sexual practices can impact the way we feel erotically. Unfortunately, there is such a rush when it comes to sex. A lot of people don't enjoy the journey because they're so focused on the destination and they feel that sex has to be penetrative for it to be successful and they feel like they need to perform and they need to have an orgasm for it to be pleasurable. But none of that's true. It's really about what you make it. And I really believe in taking it slow For some reason, we've come up with the word foreplay, which kind of indicates that there's a whole area of activities that should be done before penetration. But I don't believe in foreplay. I just believe in having fun. All of that is still part of your sexual menu and can be the main course if you would like it to be. And that's something that I teach a lot in my practice that, you know, oral sex is still sex. You know, hand play is still a full meal, you know, playing with vibrators, playing with toys, playing with each other's bodies, not even playing with the genitals is still eroticism. It's still sex. So if we can redefine the way that we feel about sex, we're able to have a much more open and expansive and fun sex life. Let's go back to talking about orgasm and that being sort of the end result of sex. So I imagine for the majority of people on the planet, (laughs) or at least in the West, that sex is, is is kind of routine, right? It's like I, I come, you come, and now that activity is over. How have we ended up in a place like that? You know what? That's such a good question. I think that it comes down to communication and people just wanting to not prioritize their sex life. If they feel like they've got a recipe that works, they stick with that recipe instead of trying to expand on it. And if they feel pleasure at the end, I mean, orgasm is a beautiful and powerful thing. But there's a lot of women that also can't have orgasms too. They just feel like 
this is a place that they should be. And I guess because penetration leads to ejaculation and orgasm in the majority of penis owners, that's where the focus has been because it comes back to the fact that women haven't been taught about pleasure. You know, they haven't been taught that pleasure is for them. They've been taught that a penetrative orgasm is a successful orgasm, and that's just not the case because for 70% of women, they need to have clitoral stimulation in order to have a good time in the bedroom and look the clitoris is nowhere near the vaginal opening so you know if that gets neglected there's a whole heap of people that are being excluded from having that kind of orgasmic capacity and I think that this rush to the end this rush to finish your sexual experience by having an orgasm is just kind of saying you know what I'm finding it difficult to find pleasure in different aspects because I've never been taught how to enjoy the journey how to expand on my eroticism a little bit of terminology what is an orgasm An orgasm is this beautiful euphoric feeling that you feel that starts in your brain actually and it's like a build-up of tension, of emotion, of pleasure and it is something that can be caused by stimulation, you know, of the penis, of the clitoris, of the vagina, or you can feel it on other areas of your body, like a nipple orgasm. So pleasure, like an explosion of pleasure that you feel from stimulation in those areas, or you don't have to have any physical stimulation to be able to experience orgasmic qualities. So there's a lot of people that have orgasms in their sleep or they can have it while having exercise because core exercises are pushing blood down towards the genital area and stimulating those nerve endings that may cause the orgasm. I really think that it it is something very special and sacred and something that a lot of people are really hoping to get in their lives. But If it doesn't happen, that's fine because there are so many pleasurable things that you can do in the bedroom that don't involve penetration nor orgasm. Can you talk a little bit about the different types of orgasms that women may experience and if it is something that with practice and with intention that they're able to change for themselves? Yeah, of course. So you can have a orgasm that is achieved, I guess, by awareness and attention to different body parts or just in on yourself. You know, if you can take away your expectations, take away the pressure that you're putting on yourself to achieve an orgasm, you know, and build on your communication and I guess your knowledge of your body and yourself, then you're able to expand in the way that you can have orgasms. So we can have clitoral orgasms, which are If people don't know what the clitoris is, it's this pleasure center at the top of the vaginal opening on the vulva for those who have a vulva. And these orgasms are often felt on the surface on the body. They're felt in the pelvis. It's like a tingly feeling along your skin and in your brain. You can have a vaginal orgasm, which is inside your vagina. These kinds of orgasms can often be felt deeper in the body and can be stimulated by the nerve endings of the clitoris that are surrounding the vagina. So the clitoris is about seven centimeters long into the body. And for some lucky people, if they have penetration, they're able to get a vaginal orgasm. About 30% of women can achieve these types of orgasms. We can have anal orgasms, so contractions around the anus, stimulation from the nerve endings there. We can have combination orgasms where maybe a combination of vaginal, clitoral, and anal orgasms. We can have different types of orgasms in erogenous zones, so ears, nipples, neck, elbows, knees. And these can be caused by pleasurable reactions when these areas are kissed and played with. And for very sensitive people, continuous play can lead to an orgasmic experience. Have you listened to season one of The Shift? If you're enjoying this conversation, you'll love season one, where we deep dive into the field of gut health with 24 of the world leaders in this area. Once you're done, head back to your podcast app and find episode one. It's a great place to start.
I want to talk a little bit about the stress side of things, I guess, but also the inability of a lot of women to be able to surrender or relax or or allow this from that point of view. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm, Absolutely. I think that we are holding ourselves as a society and especially these generations that we're in right now have such high expectations of what we should be doing and what we should be achieving. We don't know how to take it slow. We don't know how to be present and enjoy the moment because, you know, for a lot of people, they go into an erotic experience and they're like, well, we haven't done it in a week. We should get it done, you know, and they're lying there and they're interacting in these circumstances, but their mind is elsewhere. They're so stressed that they're thinking about their to-do list, their kids, you know, the dishwashing, the the dust on the fan on the ceiling above them. They are so adverse to focusing in on their selves and the way that their partner is touching them and their ability to be mindful and present in those situations and simply drop into their body and allow themselves that period of time to experience pleasure. Stress and sex are just such a bad combo. It's not a good cocktail. And basically, if we are allowing ourselves to give some space and prioritize our sex lives, especially with with our own bodies and our masturbation techniques and with our pleasure, then we are able to focus on having a better, more healthy space. If we don't have time to have sex, if we are so stressed out, our body is just going to shut off and we're going to go back to that prison element. We are locked in our body. We are locked in our prison. We are not able to open the doors of our chateau and let anyone in. So we could almost use sex and our sexual encounters and how we're feeling and our ability to be able to let go and orgasm as a bit of a barometer to go, what is going on in my life and what am I holding on to or why am I stressed or where is my mind right now if I'm not right here in my body? Mm, And yeah, absolutely. And look, sex, skin on skin contact, orgasms, these are all activities that can relieve stress these are good you know these are good like antidepressants they release a lot of endorphins in our body that relieve pain that make us feel more relaxed they make us sleep better and they are able to bring pleasure to our lives so the fact that people put it on the back burner is really confusing to me because it's so important in your overall sense of health and well-being So this program's called The Shift, and what I would love to know is what has been the biggest shift that's occurred in your life, and what are the lessons that you learned from that? Oh, the biggest shift that I've occurred in my life. I feel like every year I learn something new, to be honest. The biggest shift that I've had, I guess, is just developing into an adult and going through different relationships and learning how to communicate within those relationships and prioritize myself, because if I am not taking care of myself, my health, my well-being, my sexuality, my level of desires. If I'm, you know, putting too much attention on others and, you know, I'm a carer, I'm in a role that is caring for people all day. You know, my job is to look after people. And if I don't look after myself, then I cannot be there for other people. So my role entails me to take care and that has I guess been the biggest shift you know moving away from any toxicity in my life and making sure that I live a life that is happy that is pleasurable that is fun that is light that is educated is the way that I guess I'm able to move forward and achieve everything that I want to achieve and help as many people as I do help. If you could give advice to your younger self or to young women to help them navigate this world that we're in right now, what would you say? That you're worth it. (laughs) You're worth focusing all that attention on you. And I'm not talking from an egotistical kind of way. I'm not talking about material goods. I'm not talking about a sense of hierarchy or elitism. I'm talking about the fact that you're beautiful and that you're wonderful And that you're allowed to be whoever you want to be as long as you are kind and empathetic and treat others well. I guess that's the most important thing. You know, ditch the scales. I think that that would be a really positive thing. Go off the way that you feel, the way that your clothes fit, the way that your skin looks, you know, focus on taking time off. I'm very lucky as well in my clinic to be able to organize my own schedule and I work that around my menstrual cycle and my energies and I allow all of my staff to manage their own schedules too and I know that that's you know a very privileged place to be but 
that is the way for me to live a more wholesome life and for me to have a better sense of self and wellness. And I really feel like everyone should be able to negotiate that within their workspaces and within their friendship groups to be able to not feel pressure to have to perform all the time, but to actually allow themselves to take care. First steps for people who are listening to this and going, all right, I need some help. What do I do? Oh, first thing, just write an email and try and get in with a sexologist. I mean, all my team work online and in person. So, you know, if you want to come to my clinic, you are absolutely welcome. A lot of my patients describe my clinic as like Nimbin. It's like people are just passing by. It's like so, everyone's so friendly and my dog comes into all my sessions and it's so easy and relaxed. Um, it's not intense and you know, I guess grating, it should be a place where you feel really safe and beautiful and whole. So if you can just start researching someone that is in the sexual field or even in the psychological field, if it's, you know, about self and, and, you know, maybe relationships outside of sexuality and just reach out, ask for help, be vulnerable. That is the first step that you should do. If you could give just one piece of advice for someone that wanted to make a shift in their health or their life, what would it be? be vulnerable. (laughs) You know, don't try and do it all by yourself. Find a practitioner that is willing to advocate for you. You know, I have this week had so many patients come in who are seeing a myriad of specialists. They're being referred left, right, and center without someone actually managing their case and why they are not feeling well. So one of my girls this week, her stress levels, like her mental health was like a four out of 10 with like 10 being the highest in the way that she feels. And she was seeing a gynae and she was seeing a pelvic floor physio and she was seeing a naturopath and acupuncturist and a psychologist. And no one was talking to each other. And no one actually just said to her, hang on, why are you going to all these sessions when maybe we just need to focus on what makes you feel good? How do you have fun? What can you do to slow down your life? What conversations can you have with your with your workplace to be able to make sure that you have time to prioritize yourself? Because she was so stressed going to all these appointments that it was just canceling out any of the good work that she was able to do. And for me, I just think focus on yourself and have a practitioner that is willing to advocate and tell you how it is, that it's going to be okay and that they are going to take care of you. Chantel, thank you so much for joining me on The Shift. I've enjoyed every minute of this conversation. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I really hope that this helps people and you're doing an amazing thing. Wow, there was so much amazing information in this episode. Let's review some of the key points and what action you can take as a result of them. The first one is to think of sexuality as a part of your health. Sex has emotional and physiological consequences, and when it works, it helps us to thrive, but when it doesn't, it can really impair our lives. The first step is understanding how it fits into your picture to see if it's something that you need to work on. Your sexual self-esteem is how you feel about yourself, your body, and your sexuality. Cultivating sexual self-esteem should be part of your self-care and does not necessarily need to involve another person. We've talked about the impact of past trauma and assault on women's health issues in the past, and in this conversation we talked about pain with intercourse and the inability to reach climax due to this. If you're noticing any of these themes coming up for you, help is available. We need to look at this as part of the landscape of our health and that these kind of issues can be feedback from your body that something needs healing. Learning is great, but action is better. Here are a few things that you could do as a result of this conversation in order to help you shift your health and your life. What is one way that you could connect with your sexuality right now? Could it be wearing clothes or underwear that make you feel sensual? Having a nice bath and feeling the water on your skin? Connecting with your partner through massage or touch? What small acts of self-care can you do each day to work on your sexual self-esteem? If sexuality feels too taboo or shameful for you, I'd suggest following Chantelle on Instagram where she breaks a lot of taboos and educates about all things sexual health. 
listen to some more podcasts, read up on sexuality, and begin to break through the preconceived barriers of how we should feel about our own sexuality, which often comes with secrecy and shame when really it should not. Thank you so much, Chantelle, for sharing your insights and expertise with us on The Shift. You can learn more about Chantelle Otten by visiting ChantelleOtten.com. That's C-H-A-N-T-E-L-L-E-O-T-T-E-N.com, where you can book appointments with her team and also access her online courses. She has a big Instagram following where you can check her out at Chantelle Otten Sexologist. If you like this episode, please let us know by sharing on social media and tagging Chantelle and myself, Catherine Maslin, or The Shift Clinic so we can hear what you have to say. Or you can leave a comment on Spotify or a review in Apple Podcasts. This is the second last episode of the Season 2 Expert Series. In the next episode, I'll be riding solo for the first time on The Shift, talking about the journey of healing. I've conducted over 65,000 consultations, and one thing I know for sure is that there is a formula when it comes to making a shift. I'll be sharing this with you in the next episode. series is a production of The Shift Clinic, hosted by Catherine Maslin. Music and sound design by Shade Furlong. Thank you to all of our experts. For more details on them, go to theshiftclinic.com. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequality. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how we will get it done. The Global Goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. The Global Goals are a framework that collectively help us support the health of our people and the planet. At SHIFT, we are ambassadors for the Global Goals. This project supports Global Goal number six. Clean water and sanitation. Every time you listen to an episode of The SHIFT, we provide a day's access to clean water for a human in need in Malawi, Africa. Water Water is the the foundation foundation to health, and and we we believe every human should have access to clean, healthy water. So please share this podcast wide and and keep keep tuning in in. so we can impact those who need it the most.